Greetings. Welcome one and all to the city of Corvesa, the setting for this actual play of Curse of the Crimson Throne. All of us here at Roll Tales recommend that you at least be 18 years of age before joining us on this dark fantasy adventure path. Curse of the Crimson Throne contains mature content and discretion is advised. Now the time has come. Prepare yourselves. This is a tale of cause and effect. Let's play a game. Let's roll. Hello everyone and welcome back to Curse of the Crimson Throne, Edge of Anarchy. My name's Mark Alexander Cross, welcome back to Roll Tales. I'm back as ever with Alex, Greg, Kieran and Topher and well, gentlemen, last week got a little bit dicey, didn't it? Yeah. I'd like to say so. Well, the two melee combatants are pretty much hanging on to the last rows of life, while the two range combatants I think I'm looking pretty a okay. Greg? I'm not bad. I'm not yeah. bad. I've got pretty much most of my life. What about you, Typho? Is Romeo? I think Romeo's still looking I'm good. On, I'm on seven out of seventeen, so um, pretty, uh, pretty bit, a bit banged up. Yep. Mm. <laughs> well, you fought Gadrian and you won. But, you know, I want to ask, that was your first boss encounter, and I know Greg has done it a couple of times now. As I've said before, we've had a go at this adventure path a couple of times, but, again, for those watching, spoilers in terms of player knowledge, there's not going to be all that much. The last couple of times I've done this game has been a heavily modified playthrough because I was bored and I wanted to try something different. And today, it's, uh, or this time around, is going to be more of a core thing, sticking to more of the book, which a lot of these players have not experienced before. Not even Greg on his first playthrough with me of this game. So, yeah, it is going to be a different kettle of fish. So, how did you find that first boss encounter? Because, you know, Pathfinder, or this edition of Pathfinder, you get these small encounters where you might face only one or two enemies, but they're huge in terms of scale and stakes and, quite frankly, how hard they hit. So, how did you find it last week? Yeah, it was all good for me. Yeah. I, yeah. Almost dicey. Had to use the Harrow card. Yeah. How did everyone... How is everyone finding their Harrow powers, actually? I like Helpful. mine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I'm I must admit if I'm I don't usually tap myself on the back because I try to be quite modest but I think they're fair you know I don't think they're overly great they do a big thing which they're supposed to do mm. but I don't think they're overly game breaking you know they they would be if they were a constant effect in combat instead of a single use yeah hmm. we got to find some way to recharge or the mm. next book yeah i think the key to balancing it is just how often they recharge and you know well, if, yeah, if, if, if they recharged every other combat or once a week or something then yeah it may possibly get a bit much so uh... well, it's, it's it's funny it's funny that you mentioned that though because sitting down for these recording sessions today because i'll be honest to those people who are watching us today generally what we do is we sit down and we do about two sessions for recording it's nice, simple, comfortable, and yeah, it just works out well for us here at Roll Tales. But today we might actually dig into that, actually, how they may recharge. Because as I've noted to the players right now, and they have seen, I have brought the brand new Harrow deck and the module expansion that came for Foundry with it. So today we might actually dig in to one of this game's most... <coughs> unique mechanics by potentially having a Harrow reading. That's not going to be a guarantee, but there is a possibility that we may get there in today's sit-down recording session. If I was to hazard a guess for the viewer, it's probably not going to be this session, but the next one where you will see it. So think of it like this, something for you to look forward to next week. But for right here, right now, the only thing we need to sort out is some loot and wrapping up the mystery of the old fishery. So, is everyone down to tango? Indeedy. Mm hmm. All right. Grab your dance partner then. Let's tango. 
But before that, let's do the recap. So, the last time we played Curse of the Crimson Throne, our party navigated their way through the old fishery and finally got to Gajan Larm. There, in Gajan's personal little playground underneath the fishery itself, they did battle with the aging crime lord and his pet alligator, Gobblegut. The battle was pretty fierce, and well, there was a couple of incidences where Gadrian got the upper hand. Party members went down, but then they came back as the Harrow took a hold on their lives and influenced their lives in multiple ways. Ark was able to resist a devastating opening attack from both Gadrian and Gobblegut due to his harrow. Ronish was able to come back from the brink of death due to his. Feral managed to hit harder than what he had ever managed to hit harder before in his life or up until this point. And Romeo felt his harrow bring back the former Sable Company sergeant of old as a level of fitness training and expertise from years ago briefly returned to the seer elf and he managed to plant two devastating arrow shots into Gadrian's back which along with Feral's harrow ability turned the tide of the fight with the old crime lord dead and vengeance and justice seemingly achieved this is where we bring today's game back in okay so we return to the old fishery and we have just got the aftermath of the battle with gobblegut and gadrin a quick note about what you see on the map Two tokens remain on the board. Gadrons and Yargins. A party uh, party member, I think it was Ark last time, had noticed Yargins tattered and bloody coat and gear at the bank of Gobblegut's personal little den here. And well, let's just say this. After retreating from you all and heading towards his boss to warn him of your arrival things did not end well for Yargen though his remains are also here represented by his token the floor is yours what would you like to do Greg we'll start actually with Ark mm, you are seemingly right next to literally one square to your west you are seemingly next to Gadron's personal little treasure trove what are we doing? yeah uh, call shotgun <laughs> you call shotgun what's a shotgun? can somebody drag me over there please? <laughs> I'm just going to begin to slowly <laughs> make my Decrepled body way over here. You're not allowed to drop down there. You drop oh, down. Down there, <laughs> sorry, yeah. How many hit points you left that runnish? One. Oh, bloody hell. <laughs> I'm limping. <laughs> yes. Well, let's see what he's got in his, like... Let's see what stuff he had, I suppose. All right, so the party loot box you, you uh... can... Oh, sorry, go ahead, Romeo. I beg your pardon. Uh, do you need a health potion, Ronesh? Um, I, I have one if you need uh, need anything. Uh, yes, please. That would be great. Once I feel a bit better, I can try and heal us all up a little. I will hand you my minor, my only minor, so that you can use it it's in the loot box thank you yeah party loot box is in uh the player characters folder 
So, okay. Ark, you take a look at Gadrian's treasures, and here's what I'm doing for identification for this game. It's simply going to be a case of your adventures experience will pretty tell you what most of these items are. The only time I'm going to get you to do an identification check is if you get an item of a stupidly high level. Oh, Ronish. Wow. wow. <laughs> One point of healing. It started already. Oh, I'm not allowed to roll anything higher than a one. <laughs> Hold on a second. Hold on a second. I'm going to be a merciful GM. We're I'm going to roll a D8 myself. And I rolled another one. I rolled as I rolled as I rolled as, I rolled as, I rolled as one. Oh. I, I have a very, very strong feeling that before a few more sessions, Ranesh might be dead and there might be a re-rolling of a character. Just, I don't think he's long for this world. <laughs> All right. So it just don't get any splinters. You restore uh, one hit point, which is better than now. And so be what, up to two, and I. Yes. So back yeah. to the identification of items. Um, unless it's an item that is either a stupidly higher level than yourselves, or unless it's an item that is anything more than common, then don't worry about identification. I would say that from your respective experiences. You know what these things are or you've at least heard of them but in the loot box there's still a pouch of 20 copper pieces and 20 silver pieces has anybody claimed them uh i've got the one pouch i think we each got one pouch of copper unless someone hasn't taken theirs uh i think what i did is i manually added mine that's fine as as long as they're being manually added i'll delete them then just so long as there's, you know, because I want to keep the party loot box a bit more tidy during this actual play. So if you but don't. I play... didn't realize um, that you'd actually put it in there. I thought you just said divvy that up between you and I'm just so used to doing it manually. So I apologize. No, no, it's all right. It's all right. It's all right. As long as it's been done, it's been done. I don't mind. It's just Greg can attest to this. We've had actual plays where the loot box has stayed full for about four to five sessions. And it's like, come on, sort it out. What are you yeah. having? So, yeah, if you don't claim this stuff in a certain amount of time, it's going to disappear. And that's how I'm ruling it. So, here's what you find out of Gadrian's personal stash. First, the coinage. 30 gold pieces. Lovely. Um, you find an acid flask. A lesser acid flask vial. Then you find three suits of armor, which may or may not be good to wear for some party members but selling is also going to be a big thing in this actual play because when we level up we'll explain to the folks at home what we're doing in terms of how we're leveling up this game and how we're progressing but gold is still going to be a thing so with that you find three suits of armor that Gadrian has collected over the years that are worth a damn and worth either using or selling the first is a suit of split mail armor. The second is half plate armor. And the third, Gadrian has managed to somehow collect over the years a set of full plate armor. Ooh. Then we've got some consumables. Ark, a poison that you may be familiar with. Belladonna. Group study, of course. Mm, of course. Then you've got two items of alchemy. A quicksilver mutagen. Lesser. One that may be a help to Ronish right now. Uh, Elixir of Life Miner. And then something that is <laughs> underrated in a Pathfinder game. And I'm going to encourage this party, especially the way we're level progressing, Consider consumables like this a bit more. An owlbear claw. Now what I mean by this is this consumable is you affix it to a weapon and it's only a one-shot use. But the owlbear claw, if you hit with it, you get your weapons critical effect specialization early. Which, long explanation short, is very powerful at low levels. So Keep that stuff in mind. So I don't know about... Could you 
explain so what so the you get weapons cloth. critical specialization effect so yeah <clears throat> basically what that means then kieran is every weapon and every weapon group in pathfinder 2e has a critical specialization effect now you use fists which is uh the brawling group so hold on let me actually go to the archives in Nephis and i'll let you know what you uh what it does uh for example Beryl has a falchion, which is a sword. Uh, that critical specialization effect is the sword group is uh, your target becomes flat-footed until the start of your next turn. Okay. So the brawling group. Uh, let's have a look. Let's see. So the axe. Uh, da, 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 critical specialization effects. Uh, to give to give another example, an, an axe here choose one creature adjudicant to the initial target and with it within reach. If its AC is lower than the attack roll for the critical hit, you deal damage to that creature equals to the result of the weapon die damage you rolled. So that's what an axe does. Yours, Kieran, in the brawling group. Your critical specialization effect is the target must succeed at a fortitude save against your class DC or be slowed one until the until the end of your next turn. Oh, okay. Ark, he's very <coughs> rarely going to get into melee, but his staff is a club. If uh, his uh, specialization effect would be he will have the ability to knock the target away from him up to 10 feet using That's force cool. move using force movement and romeo who uses the bow uh if the target of the critical hit is adjudicated to a surface it gets stuck to the surface by the bow shot that's cool yes so usually you will get critical uh specialization effects at higher levels i think greg it's about seventh uh critical specialization is normally around fifth fifth is it fighters then who might get a bit earlier because fighters are fighters I don't think fighters actually get it earlier. Oh, okay. I've... Oh, no, they just get stupid proficiency uh, earlier. Yeah. They just, yeah. Is it seven or fifth? It's one of the two. I think off the top of my head, and if anybody knows in the comments below, feel free to let us know. But I think off the top of my head, because I think this is where I'm thinking with the fighter thing, I think it's seventh level for most classes, but I think the fighters get it at fifth. Yeah. Um, don't they go up to expert around the same time? Fighters start at expert for attacks. Ah. That's their jam. Fighters hit. Uh, no, that, that, no, that's that's the, that's the same. Barbarians hit, but fighters crit. So, just to make sure I definitely understand that. So that elbow claw, if you equip it, anyone equips it, and then they land a hit, they get that buff as a permanent early thing, or is it just for that one attack? One use only cool but the good thing about it is you can land the strike first and then turn around and say i'm going to use it oh okay so it's not a case of you declare it before i don't think that would be fun it's more of a case of you land your strike and you're going to say right i'm going to use the albert claw bang and that's what I'm, and that's how i'm going to rule it for this campaign nice. all right so that's that loot there a uh, bit of an explanation there, but it's good to learn these things. So, what's next, everybody? Well, I'll just... Well, I found some interesting things. He's got a bit of gold. Three sets of armor. Does anybody need any armor? Uh, I got... don't wear it, but uh, any no. of you... You could use that as a planter, I suppose, if you're into plants. A plant pot, full plate suit of armor. Can, can anybody wear the full plate? Silence Is suggests it? no, but don't forget as well, team, you can sell this stuff as long as everything's mm. okay in the environment. The average selling price is half of its value, and its value is in the descriptors of each of the items. Well, if none of us can take it, we must as well sell it. Should be a waste of money just to have around. 
There's this. Th we found it. Oh, uh, we found one of Yargin's little tricks with the acid. Hmm. Could be useful. Do you want it? Chuck it at the guy, I don't know. Uh, over a door. Let's gather everything up and uh, we then can... Then decide, yes. Yes. Uh, All right, so is anybody going to take a look at Yargin and Gajun's bodies then? Is uh, anybody... Do we actually... I... Go ahead, Greg. No, no, I was just going to say, was I the only one who noticed it, or did everyone has everyone else finally noticed it as well? I think at this point, everyone can spot it. Fantastic. It's Yargun's decades-old coat now tattered apart and splattered apart. Uh, how far is the drop down to... Um... Five foot. Five foot. Cool. Yeah. I'm going to lower broken. myself down there. <laughs> Yeah, the reason the reason why um, the reason why Gubblegut was making leap checks last time was just because of the sheer size and scale of the croc. So he was uh, basically more making powerful leap checks for body control, if that makes sense. Uh, I will search um, Yargin. Okay, Yargin has on him a. This is what has survived. From uh, his uh, tussle with Gobblegut. Yargin has on him a dagger. You find his crossbow bolts case, but you see the crossbow destroyed. And then something that Ark will recognize immediately a level one wand of the Ooh. spell Acidic Burst. That'll be handy. You're getting all the loots today. <laughs> all the shame. Um, it's a shame his whip didn't survive. I wanted that as a trophy. And is anybody checking the old man? Yeah, might as well. On him, he had a hand crossbow, which was quite effective against you guys. Uh, 20 bolts. Uh, actually, he's down to around about 15, I would say. So 50, a, a, a case of 15 bolts. You find his dagger on him. Some padded armor. Brass keys, which has uh, the fisheries logo embedded upon them. You pretty much guess that these are the keys to the entire fishery. And then finally, one final key, which Romeo alone at a base level could identify and tell you what it is because it is a key but it is the sort of key that would be used for either a lock box or a foot locker all right well what did what did have we found that tarot deck that Jorgen took, and well, we still need to locate it. Well, sorry, I, was on, I was just realized I was on a mute. So I, was, I was saying that I was heading, I'm going to head into this room where I was, right. uh, where I'd hidden before. Sure, I'll give you the description for this room then. This foul smelling room seems to be a combination of bedroom and study. A wooden bed with a jumpy mattress stands against the east wall while a round table heaped with dirty plates, red crusts, stained goblets, fruit rinds, and scuttling cockroaches sits nearby. At the foot of the bed sits a large strong box, a foot locker, with a slightly rusted lock securing it shut. And there on the top of it, a mouldy ledger with pages rippled from moisture sits atop. <laughs> A sagging dresser filled with moth-eaten clothes well past their glory days is in one corner. What appears to be a wooden hat box, surrounded by a small cloud of flies, sits atop this dresser. Uh, not much here. Uh, we've got, uh, what looks like a, a nice hat box that I could possibly sell. Um, but there's also what looks like a small lockbox down here. Uh, 
Not really anything much uh, apart from a lot of moldy food. Wonderful. Any of those keys we found fit that lockbox? Yeah, I hand the keys over to Romeo as he's already in the room. Oh. Oh. Let's yeah. see what's behind door number two, eh? Hmm. Uh, we have we have a few of these uh keys at our home uh, at our premises. Uh this should this should work. I uh, go over to the lockbox and all right. Check. Click on. Do you take, do you take uh, a look at the ledger that's on top of it first, or are you just moving that to the side? Uh, is it on the? Is it on top of the lockbox? It is on top of the lockbox. Uh, then I'll, I'll I'll pick it up and uh, just have a quick glance at what the front front says. It appears to be it appears to be a ledger. If you take a quick peek inside, it's coded. You know, from military experience, this usually screams importance. Well, well this is something interesting. Uh, they've uh, they've got a, a ledger with a lot of coded information in it. Really? Wonder we used what to, they... Yes, we used to kind of use it for um, if we were wanting to keep uh, enemies from knowing our information. Do you think you can actually find anything about it? Mm, give me enough time and I'm sure I can work something out. Alright, Cajun's le leisure is in the party loot box. Um, it's currently registered as uh, not identified because it hasn't been decoded yet. If you open that. Yeah, if you open up the loot box... You see inside three items of particulates. Of particulates? In particular. The first item looks to be another dagger. However, this dagger is finely crafted, well made, a step in quality above the others. However, it's strange, Romeo. The dagger has a blade that is almost shaped like a key and on said blade there is a inscription written in common that inscription says for an inspiration of a father the second item of importance you find a magnificent harrow deck Seriously, a good quality harrow deck. A fine quality harrow deck. Wow. This is, it. this is interesting. Uh, we sell these, like, novelty versions of, like, harrow decks. At... But this one... Wow. Well, it's exquisite. And also, we've got a very, very nice blade here. Looks like Honest... it's something from a son, uh, from a father to a son, it seems. Not as nice, though, as the third item. You presume for the record that that's Zalara's uh, harrowing deck that she mentioned that Gadrian had stolen. But the third item appears to be a brooch. And this brooch stands out more than anything else. It is of such fine quality that legitimately it's just looking at it alone it's it's a whistle that sort of a whistle uh, let's have a look there is a picture of it here we go this is what the brooch looks like everyone can see that Ooh. Interesting. Snake eagle and a, <clears throat> and a little imp-looking creature. Is that well, a house dragon? It is. I'll tell you what. 
hero point back into the pool for that, Kieran. Yeah, boy. Good shout. That is a house dragon. And can anyone identify what the other creature is on it? It's an imp. All right, nicely looked, done. Looked, kind of looked like an imp. Well, that's what I said. It was an imp and a weird... You will see them Wait, over no. the skies of uh, the city fighting, so surprised you didn't recognize them. Battled a few when I was a lot younger. But pretty. Well, yeah, Ronish has a point though. That is that is quite frankly the symbology of Corvosa, the pseudo dragon and the imp. If anyone is trained, they can make me a society check, please. Sure. Only if you're trained in the skill, though. Would I possibly know about it as well with uh, having been here from the beginning of Corvosa? That would still be society, mate. Cool. Alright, so both Ark and Romeo rolled a 22. As you take a second... <coughs> And then, Romeo, maybe this is the reason why he's not able to identify the symbology straight away. Because he looks at it, and he's more distracted by the quality and the craft work of this thing. It's more than fine. It's exquisite. Then Ark takes a look at it as well. And you do not know how in the hells Gadron got his hands on this. But you identify this brooch as being the personal brooch of Queen Iliosa herself that was given to her by King Eadred as a betrothal present. It was noted in the news a couple of years ago that this thing had gone missing. There was kind of a big thing about it. There's even a reward for its return now. But how the hell Gage and Lam got his hands on this is a mystery. But that is the missing brooch. Well, how on earth did he get his hands on this you know what this is right it's not just me or is it just me probably it's just, just you wait you know, sorry. It is I, I was I'm sorry I was it's, that's I can't that, that isn't possibly that item it is that this is the brooch of Queen Biosa herself the one that went missing a couple of years ago. How did this low time thief get his hands on it? We should return this. Probably. Uh, I would be. We, we need to be very careful about this, though. Uh, if we just walk in with that. There's a very high chance that they might put us in a prison or execute us on sight. I highly doubt that, especially with my family name. That will cause the... all sorts of complications for them. Do you want is to there not maybe... some kind of reward for this item? There is. I'm sure they would be most grateful to see it again. And, uh... We could always drag Gadrian's limp dead body with us. Well... Is there, is there anything in the legislation that says about this brooch? Do you think you could see it, if there's anything with her name or anything to do with the, the, the house family? Hmm. A ledger is coded. You would have to use the decipher action but that will take a little bit of time, Ark. With you, not too long. 
but yeah, that would take time still. Give me slightly a little bit more time and I can probably work out how he got his grubby little hands on it. But we do need to rest up and heal our wounds, so... Uh... Yeah, Ronish, it's not very comfortable for you right now, and I'm not just talking about um, the injuries you've sustained. I'm also talking about the fact that where you even are on the map, that location is quite close, if not next to, because that's the dresser there to yourself, of the hat box with the flies buzzing around it. And there is a god-awful smell, or god's awful smell, coming from it. Has anybody opened this yet? No. Uh, I, I saw uh, flies. Doesn't smell right. Yeah, I saw flies over it. I was not wanting to get to touch it. Uh, I'm going to open it. <laughs> Just gonna At open least it. let me get a handkerchief out or something to cover my nose. Yeah. Ronish, you open it up, and you are staggered by the sight. As inside the hat box is the severed head, poorly preserved and decorated with unsightly makeup, a crude attempt to give the dead flesh a semblance of life. The head of Zalara Esmeranda herself. There's a lot coming through on the mic, mate. God, that's disgusting. So the woman who, who gave you this job, her head is right in front of you in this box. And it looks like she's been here for some time. How long ago did she give us the job? Literally, uh, was it a few hours ago? Yeah, literally about four hours ago. Uh, um, and even in its current state, we can tell it was the exact same looking woman. It is her. And I do a medicine check to see if I can determine how long that head's been like. Yes, you can. Off the give, body. Yes, you can. Uh, public roll, just give us that medicine check. No, 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 no. Ten. That is actually exactly what you needed. The fortune teller has been dead for weeks. Uh, I don't want to alarm any of you, but uh, this head has been separated from its body for at least a week. So if she's here, who did we speak to earlier? That's a very good question. Is someone playing a trick? Or is someone trying to manipulate us? It's one or the other. Relation's probably the thing. I mean, have it all of us to hunt alarm. Mm. Can I uh, do a detect magic on like the hat, the head, and the hat box? Detect magic uh, yeah. uh, doesn't ping with anything on the head or the hat box. I'm guessing this, uh, the stuff that's close to me is would have been pinging, so that I know would have magic. But the owlbear claw is definitely pinging. Yeah. You can identify that, but something else is pinging as well. Out of everything you've gathered so far, minus the wand. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I beg your pardon. Yes. Apart from the obvious items like the Owlbear Claw, uh, the Elixir of Life doesn't count. Yeah. Believe it or not, that's a non-magical item. Um, yeah, apart from the obvious items, which is the Owlbear Claw and the um, Wand of Acidic Burst, <clears throat> if you fire off the Tech Magic a few times, there's something else that's yeah. pinging as well. It's not the strangely shaped dagger, is it? No. Roach. The, the, the harrow deck that's in, uh, that I picked up. So as you eliminate choosing to ignore the magical signals of 
the wand and the owlbear claw. You pick up the harrow deck. Yeah, that's pinging with magic. Well, this is interesting. Not only is it an extremely exquisite item of flowers, but uh, it seems to have a lot of magic on it as well. Interesting. Can, is, it, can I, you... is, it, is it able to open? You can open the Harrow deck and there yeah. you, you just shuffle through the cards and yeah, they're just all fine, exquisite Harrow cards. Now, however, Ark also wanted to say something. What you got, yeah, Ark? Sorry. Is it magic itself that keeps the cards clean and pristine? Or does it do something in particular? I... I don't, I don't actually know, uh, but uh, we have four Harrow cards ourselves. Uh, are these are they in here, or are, am I? Are we holding the Harrow cards from this deck? Each of the Harrow cards uh, you received transfigurated into the notes that you read. When you look through this deck. The four Harrow cards that were chosen to represent you for are in this deck and they do appear to... Obviously this deck is a set, a unique set, but still a set that can be purchased for a large sum of gold. But looking at them, I would say with confidence, it's the same, it's the same design, it's the same artwork. So potentially, yes. These could be the Harrow cards that were sent to you. Right, this is rather odd. Uh... Well, are we just going to stand around in a potential place where we can be incriminated for other things, or shall we get moving? I yes, uh, think we should get the hell out of here. Just a quick question to the more learned gentleman here. Is there any reward for Larm at all? Hmm. Ark, you would actually notice the answer to this is actually no. He's too low rung on the ladder. This ledger, though, Considering it's coded, maybe. Lam, unfortunately, is too small time. There is no reward for him. However, the ledger, with all of his business dealings, yes, that'll probably be worth something. So there's no point in bringing his head along for any reward then. No, we could torch this place, but I fear it probably start fires in other uh, places. Uh, 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 please don't talk. Uh, it used to uh, be owned by a, a friend of mine, so if we could not torch his old premises. Hmm. Well, I was thinking if we take. Uh, if we take the keys, perhaps we can use this place. If we ever need to hide, hide out or lay low. Yes, but we might want to feed the shark if we do that. We've got a Gadrian body, I suppose. Hmm. <laughs> All right, then. Uh so, what are we, go ahead. Uh, no, go what are we gonna do, do with the uh, head of that girl? If they, she was here, who was it that was wanting to find the Harrow deck? That was the question I posed earlier. Well, if 
if we act like we don't know. Arrange to meet up with this imposter. And then, when we're sure, we have them in a position of uh, authority. We can present this head and request that they reveal their true nature. As long as you can carry it, I don't want anything to do with it. Ah, uh, stick it in my bag. Hmm. Okay, I'm not loop you'll get from that. Yeah, I'm not going to put that as an item in the loot box, but <laughs> in fairness, that is, I'm not going to lie, I think that is kind of valid as well, considering, I know that's effed up to say, but I think it's dawning on the party that you're in a pretty effed up situation. Also, okay, you did what you came here to do, but now things have taken a strange twist. How strange? Mm. Well, I'll tell you. 120 experience points worth of strange for beating the old fishery. And recovering Zalara's harrow deck is also an achievement marker worth Ooh. another 30 experience points. We ding! Ding, 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 ding! It does carry over, doesn't it, Mark? That's 150, yeah? Yes, it, yes, it does carry... Yes, any experience points does carry over into level two. So that was 150 total, which I think is exactly enough for you to do. 800. Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. All right, then. Everyone reaches level yeah. two. Well done. Fantastic. Okay. So, everyone on their sheets mark level two and then reset the counter to zero because I believe that was 800 exactly. For the record, I actually gave the option of about 950 XP to be potentially earned at the foundry. So that was a, uh, uh, not the foundry at the fishery. So there was actually a couple of things you all missed, but Ooh. that's cool. You're all level two, and here is what that means. I need to borrow somebody's character sheet because now I'm going to quickly explain what we're doing in terms of this game. Ark, I'm going to actually borrow your character sheet for the uh, game overlay and yep. we are playing two variant rules for our actual play of Curse of the Crimson Throne. The first variant rule is called Automatic Bonus Progression where during the course of the campaign instead of me handing out a bunch of magical items to power up the party's attacks and skill chances and armor no wait i still have to give out armor bonuses the party are going to naturally progress so at level two i will reveal everyone's strikes to hit will now have a plus one to them so everyone has got a plus one to their attacks and the foundry has auto calculated that for you as well ah, nice I will bring up I will bring up the APB table as well to explain what you get at later levels. For example, instead of getting striking runes at level four, when you hit level four in your character sheet, your weapon attack dice, no matter the weapon, will go up from one dice to two. Basically nice. the reason yeah, the reason why I've done this for those watching in is I've used automatic bonus progression because this is a conversion. I'm gonna be blunt about this. It just saves me a little bit of time when converting the loot. That means instead of worrying and focusing about when they should get armor potency ruins, armor I, um, skill bonus ruins, and that sort of stuff, I can now just give them the cool magic items like the owlbear claws, the ring of the rams, the necklace of fireballs. It just makes it that much easier for me on my preparation. Also, a second optional rule that I am playing is gradual ability boosts. Could everyone on their character sheet click on the edit button above their ability scores? Ooh. Mm -hmm. I see, I see, I see. Now, usually in Pathfinder 2, what happens is you boost your ability scores at levels 5, 10, 15 and 20 you get four more ability boosts 
But what I think works better for this campaign, because depending on what you learn, is you get a gradual ability boost. What that means, instead of waiting until level 5, at level 2, you get one boost. At level 3, you get another boost. At level 4, you get another boost. Then another one at level 5. So you get one ability boost per level. They don't stack. Once you, let's say, arc this level, he boosts his charisma. He can't do that again until he gets his next set of gradual ability boosts at level 7. Mm, okay. So think about how your character has progressed. Think about what they have learnt this level and apply that to the boost that you think makes the most sense. For example, Feral just hit a tremendous critical hit this session, uh, last session. So maybe Feral wants to improve his strength by two, so his boost will go into that. Maybe hmm. Ark didn't like the way that Gadrian was dodging all of his electric arc attacks. So maybe he decides to boost his charisma by two to make his spell power a bit more potent. Maybe Ronish wants to improve his speed a little bit so his AC goes up by another one. Maybe Romeo will boost his intelligence to make his skill checks a little bit better, etc. The only thing that stays the same from the regular rules is once you hit a score of 18, an ability boost does not increase your score by two, it just increases it by one. So Ronish is strength 18, I believe. Mm -hmm. So if Ronish wanted to improve his strength, you won't go to strength 20, you'll go to strength 19. You do okay. So, the only thing I will ask out of respect is once you have made your ability boost choice, please commit to them. Yeah, that'll do. No yeah. worries. Whacked it in decks. I put mine in charisma. Also, a personal homebrew rule of mine before you do the usual leveling up stuff. Uh, natural healing, because leveling up represents a change in power, a change in yourself, a change in strength. So everyone who is injured gets a natural healing based on their ancestry hit points. So for Ark, Ronish, and Feral, you restore eight hit points naturally. For Romeo, you restore six. And uh, now to look at my sorcerer table, because I need to look at something. Yes. But I think for this session, in future sessions, we'll do level ups offline. But I think for this one session, and if anybody out there wants to learn how to play Pathfinder, then I think this might be a nice tool to help inform the people. If you don't want to watch this, don't worry. I will put a chapter marker down below that will just flick you over to the next point when we get back into the action and we get back into the story. So, Feral. Level two, mm -hmm. my friend. Yeah. Where'd you put that score boost? Uh, well, I was considering uh, Constitution just to give my health a little bit more of a beef, but I think with the rolls we've had, I, I could do with the additional, so I've gone for strength. Nice. You know what you want a second level yet? Uh, what, what are you looking now? Yeah, I'm pretty much looking now. Awesome. So the Barbarian at level 2, for anybody who is interested, they get... Uh, let's see. Let's uh, one class, one skill. Yes. So Feral can take now one additional class feat for being a Barbarian and one skill feat, which improves is well skills quite frankly skill feats are used to use the skills on your skill list and give them special abilities okay arc where, arc where's arc where's your boost gone 
my boost is gone into charisma because he tried to t uh, due to his intimidating tactics and his way his spells weren't really hitting he's gone to see if he can change the dynamic more with intimidating glares and things like that nice okay so let's have a quick look at what the sorcerer gets at level two one class mm -hmm. one skill any new spells or spell slots i have four spell slots i believe nice all right we'll let greg sort that out let me just have a look Alright, Ronish, you've uh, taken some decks? Uh, yeah, I think that's probably... <clears throat> it was that or I was going to take some um, something to boost my medicine score, but I think for now. That's cool. Try, that's cool. try not to get hit. Well, that raises your AC up to 19, <laughs> mm -hmm. which is pretty good at level 2. Uh, so let's have a look at the monk. The monk at level two gets one class feat and one skill feat as well. Uh, Kieran, if you press the browse button on each section, it should filter out all the necessary things you need as well to find. Okie dokie. And then finally, um... Romeo, where you put your boost, mate? Uh, I put it in charisma because I. When, uh, figuring that um, when I was trying to talk the per people out of uh, the gentleman at the front door and not really doing uh, very well of trying to keep them calm and everything uh, and the, the uh, kids that were a part of the orphanage uh, I kind of want to be able to be able to converse, converse like and help them and help other people without having to dip into just straight up punching and attacking people. No, that makes sense. I like the RP choice. Uh, you can also give assist rolls to Ark as well, who's primarily the charisma-based mm. guy in some of his stuff as well. And aiding and boosting, I know that's getting a rework in the upcoming remaster, but that's still pretty formidable if done together and work together in the right place. 2E for those watching in is more about working together teamwork making the dream work not saying it's not like that in first edition pathfinder or even going into dungeons and dragons but in DD and pathfinder one it was more about being a particular pillar of power and then slotting in with the other party members and what they need here with pathfinder it's more about the synergy Again, not saying there wasn't any synergy in D&D or Pathfinder 1, but it was more being good at one thing and then another player identifying what they were good at and using that thing and so on. Here it's more about, I've got these skills, how will it work with the others? So, one class feat and one skill feat for Romeo as well. Sorry, Mark, I've got under my class feet. Yes. It's got monk and archetype listed. Archety Should archetype be there? Archetypes, yes, because archetypes, if you meet the pre-requirements, are essentially cross-classes. Oh. That's how they cross-class. If you don't want them, though, uh, you can get rid of that by clicking off archetype in the traits. And for those watching in who like to play the free archetype variant, no, that is not taking place in this game, or at least not yet. And the reason why it's not is because I think free archetype, in my own personal experience, works better and is suited for particular campaigns. I don't think with Curse of the Crimson Throne, free archetype is... How could I put this? I don't think in the story would there be a reason why Ark would be a Imperial Sorcerer but lo and behold he's got a little bit of um, I don't know Druid to him. Maybe with Feral to a degree 
but not necessarily Ark. Same with Ronish. Ronish may, because he used to be one of Gadrian's boys and Gadrian actually got him addicted to Shiver, maybe there was a little bit of Rogue in his past. But I want the RP to tell this story. So if Free Archetype comes into this game, where basically, Kieran, what free archetype is, you get a free cross class. Mm -hmm. um, I want free archetype to come into this game if there is a reason for it. So let's say, for example, um, Romeo meets a former Sable Company soldier who he mentored back in the day, and this soldier encourages Romeo to stand up and be the elf he once was and teaches him how to properly fight again then free archetype with the fighter dedication does that make sense what I'm trying to say here party mm -hmm. yeah. yeah yeah I'm happy to play free archetype but only if it makes sense to our story so that's not to say it will not happen down the line Hmm. As a watch skill, what skill? I think it'd be along the lines of the intimidating route, wouldn't you think? Uh, intimidating, or it's like things to like lie to me. Hmm. So if others try to lie, I can spot them out. Lie to me is a good one, because you use your deception instead of um, perception to spot lies. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I thought you would have gone... Oh, no, I think that... No, you've already got an intimidating glare with Feral, haven't you? Uh, yes. I also got it automatically. You have intimidating... Have... No, you no, don't what? have... No, I have to use... Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Feral has intimidating glare, so... I'm going to be honest with you. Um, for you, Ark... Speaking story-wise and what you do... And again, I'm not trying to... You know, I'm not trying to railroad you. Yeah. I think Lie to Me, I'm just saying, knowing the character, what you told me about him, I think Lie to Me makes sense for Ark. Yeah, I was leaning towards Lie to Me anyway, because I use Intimidation as an action anyway, so it's not too bad. Nice. All right. So. Oh, yes. I've just I've just seen your cantrip. I've just seen your class feat, cantrip expansion. How many cantrips get... do you know now? Uh, seven. <laughs> It's Bloody just hell. handy to have some more utility. <laughs> Bloody hell. Uh, all right. Uh, let's have a look. Feral, what you've taken at level two? Uh, hang on. Let me go back on the page. Uh, there we are. I've taken uh, Rage Thrower. Because I got my, uh, my hatchets and my javelins. And I've also taken uh, Intimidating Prowess. So basically, when um, Feral I uses... Don't... Yeah, I don't need to uh, know anyone's language to uh, demoralize or anything like that. Like nice. I did despite. So with Raging Thrower, basically he can add his rage damage to anything he throws. Now, he couldn't do that. Well, you could do that before, but it would be halved, I believe. Or it Something would be like that. Yeah, yeah, it would be lessened. Uh, so yes, Intimidating Prowess, you can intimidate anybody and ignore the penalty if they don't. <laughs> nice. So you're basically a big, bulky, get out of my way or I'm going to bulldoze you. Mm -hmm. For now. Nice. Okay, uh, Ronish, how are you doing? Um, just sort of like mulling over. Is there anything that you would recommend? Uh, for you at level two? Um, I'm thinking like Stunning Fist or the Key Strike thing possibly, but I don't really know what what's good. Well, I'll tell you what each of them does. Key Strike... Uh, gives you a spell, a focus spell with one focus um, point. Um, let's have a look. The key strike spell, what does it do? You focus your key into magical attacks. You gain a plus one status bonus to attack rolls with the strikes and the strikes deals a extra 1d6 damage. This damage can be of any of the following types of your choice chosen each time you strike. Force, lawful, only if you're lawful, negative or positive so basically Kieran if you take key strike you will have one good punch 
that is uh, cast okay. via a focus point and how you get your focus points back is you spend 10 minutes meditating okay meanwhile stunning strike is a little bit different than what it is in D and D, but still pretty useful. When you hit somebody with a uh, stunning fist, it's called in Pathfinder, right? Stunning fist uh, in Pathfinder. Once again, you do stunning fist automatically when. Uh, let's see. Here we go. The focus power of your flurry threatens to overwhelm your opponent. When you target the same creature with two strikes from your flurry of blows, you can try to stun the creature. If either strike hits, so it doesn't have to be both of them, as long as one of them lands and deals damage, the target must succeed at a fortitude saving throw against your class DC or be stunned one or stunned free on a critical failure. This is an incapacitation effect. What stun does in Pathfinder Kieran is it basically removes an action. Okay. So so okay. stun one yeah, stun one means you lose one action and if they crit fail it, they lose their entire turn. And that action economy in Pathfinder, especially as we go into the later levels, is a thing. Because you okay. yeah, you will be getting opponents and you will be trying to burn their actions down. So if you want a recommendation from me from the GM side of things I would say Stunning Fist. Yeah, I think that's what we're going to have to go for, isn't it? Ooh, yeah. That's a nice little spell. I'll take that. Yes. What are you looking at, Mark? Mm. Uh, I just picked up Infectious Enthusiasm. That's not a bad one. That's have you seen a... what I've got in my spells? Not yet. Not yet. I kind of want to be surprised. But uh, do you want to hand with your skill feat, uh, Kieran? Yeah, please, man. Okay. Let's have a look. Let's see. You're trained in religion, aren't you? I think so. Yes, I believe. I think so. You're a monk. Have a look. I'm untrained in religion. Oh, then you can't take my suggestion. Oh, <laughs> whoops. Never mind. Um, let's have a look. Uh, skill. F uh, let's have a look. So I'll ask this in terms of. Um, where do you want Ronish to go in terms of his skills? Like, what do you envision him being able to do? Um, I think he's... The problem is I don't really know, like, what's available. It's, a, it's like, such, <laughs> such an open-ended question. Um, well, I'll tell you, okay, when you I picture... want him to be able to heal. I think his healing is going to be important long-term. Uh, right. So I think I just want him to be able to smash people in the face and then if he likes him, he can heal him again. Okay, then I've got the perfect suggestion for you. You want the skill feat battle medicine. Ooh, a this, good, is it? Yes, this will allow you to heal during combat. Oh. So it takes one action and James Jacobs has clarified this actually. It was either James Jacobs or Jason Borman who clarified this. Was it Logan? One of the Pathfinder team clarified this. It's only one action to use battle medicine because pulling out your healer's tools because they picture that your healer's tools would be on your belt. Mm. So pulling out your healer's tools to use battle medicine is just one action and what it does is you aim for a dc 15 heal check like you do regularly and again if you beat that heal check they regain two d8s worth of hit points nice and as you can and as you become better trained in medicine you can bump up the dc let's say when you if you become expert in medicine you can then raise the check to a DC 20 and if you hit that DC 20 you'll then be able to heal 2d8 plus 10. The only thing with battle medicine is is once you use battle medicine on a fellow party member then they are immune to the effects of battle medicine for 24 hours. Oh okay. 
but there is ways you can reduce that via additional feats down the line. Okay, okay. So if you treat wounds in downtime, um, mm. that only takes one hour to renew. But if you use battle medicine, it's one day. Right, okay. However, they don't stack on top of one another. So for example, you can use battle medicine on yourself to keep yourself up during a fight, but then during the downtime portion, you can still use treat wounds on yourself too. Okay, okay. Hmm. That might be quite useful. Yeah. Especially yeah, as you have battle medicine. Yeah, especially as you, you 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 probably will have to increase your wisdom down the line. But for now, I think you'll I think you'll suffice and be okay. Uh, Romeo, what are you thinking? Uh, at the moment, uh, for my class feet, I've done the hunted shot uh, for, for that one, uh, uh -huh. which is where it means I can take two quick shots at the one uh, I am hunting. Uh, at the moment, with the skill feet, I'm struggling uh, to figure out which one to go with. I was thinking at first. I was thinking uh, some, there was one that says something about the underground, uh, uh, underground network. Uh, with my with me being a shopkeeper and a person who has uh, a kid that used to work for the underground, well, with, within the underground uh, network, uh, gathering information from him and his past friends might be able to be a little more helpful if I was ever to try and find information out. Let's have a look. Underground network? It's what Rigby uses in the other game. Yeah. Okay, you're connected to groups that know... Because you're trained in thievery as well, aren't you? I believe so, yes. yes. Are you, do you meet the... Do you meet... Uh, do you meet the pre-requirements? Do you... Are you an expert in society and do you have the feet streetwise? Uh, 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 what would that be? Because uh, I don't think I have that. No, they're both skill feats. Uh, no. You you need. I, I'm training. I'm in training society, but you need to be an expert in society, and you need to have the streetwise feet in order to have that one. Oh. Okay. So, oh. I suppose with what you were doing last fight, you could have Nimble Crawl. Oh, I've got a suggestion, actually, Topher, if you'd like to hear one. Yeah. Considering your former Sable Company, Rolling Landing. You land with quick was, rolls. Yeah, I was looking yeah, at <laughs> Duke, that. We're on the same yeah. line. <laughs> we're, we're on the I same was, minds there. <laughs> I was kind of looking at that when I was looking at uh, uh, that that and like the powerful leap um yep. but yeah i was looking at nimble uh crawl earlier um because of the fact that uh even though he looks old he still has the the like the skills of his uh of his army prowess in him mm. well let's get this wrapped up so choose your feet and remember there is retraining options so you can retrain later on if a skill feat is not working out for you and that's another thing i'll actually say to Kieran and more so alex as we haven't really got into this much yet any skill feat that you have even a class feat within reason you can actually take some downtime to retrain out of that skill feat if it's not working out for you okay mm -hmm. so you're not locked in <clears throat> Do you mind if I take that point out of Dex and put it in Wisdom? Um, as we're doing it now, that is absolutely fine. Thank you, dude. So yeah, eight, but your AC will go, yeah, 18 AC, level 2 is not bad. And again, if and when you hit level 3, you can put the point in then. Mm. That's the good thing about uh, the gradual ability boost. You don't have to wait until level 5. Hmm pretty much done all right so if everyone is done we can sort out where the loot is going in off time that will conclude the level up
as the party leave the old fishery. Anything else you're doing while there with any, you know, is there any last things you wish to do there? And I'm just Adrian's like, head off. Right off. That's how oh, I already done that. Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah Farrell already did that. In uh, fact, I, I will put his head in my bag, and then when we, when we confront this uh, so-called imposter, we can so yeah, here's the proof. Bang on the floor. Okay. So you've got both Zalara's head and Gadrin's head. Mm. Oh, this is not a lawful good party. <laughs> All right. Can I have so a quick look for any shiver? You search around and you actually don't find any. The only thing you do find is you find in the dresser what appears to be a storage area for Shiver. You see traces of the powder remaining. But there is no jars of Shiver right now. It looks like he might have stole he might have sold his stock. That's fine. That's an interesting thing in the book, actually. He actually doesn't have any. Hmm. Even though he's a shiver peddler. Never make any money if you take your shit yourself. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> all right. So, you all leave the fishery then? Please. Yep. Okay. So, yep. with Gadrian's head in tow and Zalora's head in tow, you leave the fishery and out into the Corvosan night. Everything seems quiet everything seems peaceful it's actually gone 10 o'clock it's literally quarter past 10 in the evening now star day farest 8th the silence is then broken with the sound of bells they ring and Romeo, you flinch. You've been in Corvosa since the beginning. You know what these bells mean. These bells are actually ringing from Castle Corvosa itself. Before the realization fully dawns, you look over Corvosa's skyline and you see multiple fires have sprung up across the city. Roars of people can then be heard all around you. The city has devolved into riots. Romeo. Those bells indicate and are only ever rung oh, in one the... point in Corvosa's history. The curse of the Crimson Throne has claimed another monarch. As you hear the riotous crowds shout, The King is dead! Long live the Queen! The Queen is a harlot! Behead her! Long live the memory of King Eadred! As the city is pretty much gone to the hells. Ark to your north uh, <clears throat> west. You look up and you see a very familiar glow. A blue, shimmering, warding glow as the Academy's wards have been activated. Burn the usurper! Kill the harlot! Long live the Queen! The city has seemingly divided into two, depending on who they support. But one thing is certain. King Eadred Arabasti II is dead. And the city is falling into anarchy. 
what are the four of you doing as you witness this sight? We need to move. We are Man. not getting caught in this. Not now. He could just uh, go back down to the fishery and wait this all out. Have you seen... Oh, sorry. On. I was just going to say, have you seen the fires? <clears throat> I don't think anywhere's going to be safe for long enough for it to matter. Wow. Do you wow. suggest? Where Over were we your... supposed to meet, um, dead lady? That's not dead. That might be dead. You would presume, once again, at Free Lancet Street. Yeah, Ro that. Romeo, overhead, that whooshing noise that I just made, you see several Sable Company squadrons, airbound squadrons on the hippogriff mounts, flying into this chaos and heading towards Castle Corvosa itself, trying to protect it. But then, a stray arrow shot comes out of nowhere, hits the hippogriff, as you then see the hippogriff and its rider go down and smash into the city itself. How far off, or is it? Uh, did it just disappear into by into the crowd? Into the at, a, at a distance, pretty much around okay. the area where this uh, they, they were flying towards the castle. So it's pretty much this area here, which is about a few hundred feet away from you, I'd imagine. Let's have a look. Uh, yeah, it's about just under a thousand feet. God. Uh, we need to make a decision where we're going to go. Um, we, should... we have the Queen's brooch, so perhaps we could use that to take refuge in the castle or... Oh, good luck. You see, you... if you're seen going up towards that, you're probably going to be dead. Ark, the academy is on lockdown, as you know. You're not getting in. The academy is out. No one's in. No one's out. Should we... Is it Lancet Street where we met that lady again, sorry? Yes. Mm. Should we head back to Lancet Street and see if we can... Uh... Fortify? Yes, I suppose. And maybe this imposter might have a safe place to take us as well. Better plan than no plan. Mm. Yeah, I, I mount my uh, like great axe for uh, just in case we uh, are swamped by uh, anyone in the streets. Should we, should we stick to the harbour at bay, the bay area, and not go through the the main streets? Yes, I agree. All right, so stick into the harbour area. The party hot footed, forced march down to Freelancer Street to find, hopefully, an area of security and maybe also to get some answers to their questions. And that's where we'll close today's session of Curse of the Crimson Throne as the bells continue to ring. Yeah, so Kieran, that's the bit you missed last time. It got real, son. Oh, mm. yes. So, when we return... <laughs> oh, dear. Everyone all right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everyone alive. Well, just. But uh, when we return, we are into the section of the game where the core voice and riots have begun, and the city is spiralling very close to the edge of anarchy. And when we return, we're going to see it's going to drop off. But until then, on behalf of myself, Alex, Greg, Kieran, and Taifa, thank you all very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.
Slide down the rooftop, slide down.